background of John Marshall, but background of John Marshall. So he is right now leading or has been leading 10 year initiative of the CGIR research pro CGIR generation challenge program which is responsible for leading and coordinating a large network of partners in modern crop breeding for food security. John Marshall has cumulative experience in agricultural biotechnology and plant breeding, project and finance management and policy formulation as well as leadership skills for dispersed global R&D teams. Prior to becoming GCP director in 2005, John Marshall worked at Summit Mexico where he held positions of increasing responsibility rising to deputy director of the Agricultural Biotechnology Center in 2001 that became the Genetic Resource Program in 2003 and Biotechnology Group Leader in 2004. John Marshall holds a PhD in plant physiology but he is having extensive experience in genetics and molecular breeding and with the, basic under, with the basic emphasis on understanding the genetic basis and underlying physiological and metabolic pathways that influence plant performance under abiotic stress, particularly drought, as well as innovations in molecular breeding. Again, he has been recipient of several awards. I'm not going to mention here because of the time. But once again, please join me in welcoming Joe Masal Rivo for this presentation. And now I would like to request Dr. Paroda and Dr. Gauda maybe to go on down <laughs> to take their respective seats in that auditorium. And then thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Rajiv, for the kind word of introduction and also for mentioning my many words, although they are not so many. <laughs> so, <laughs> the European system is not very used to this word business, but it's very kind of you. Um, more seriously, thanks a lot for organizing this event. I think it has been a, a very successful event. And as I said yesterday, it's quite unique to have different uh, expertise, you know, from very upstream to very applied. And, and I think this is one of the unique feature of, of, of this uh, meeting that will link upstream and applied science. And I really hope, as we discussed also yesterday, that we can have some clear message or minutes that will come from this meeting that we can share uh, with people uh, and policymakers. Uh, I am the last one in, in, in the queue. Uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. Uh, I will not make a scientific presentation, uh, and I will also not probably make any revelations or, or you know things that you haven't think about it. But I will put on the table different elements that are really critical when we are talking about adoption, uh, awareness, uh, and implementation of some of these technologies. Because as it was very clear during several presentation, at the end we want to have an impact. Okay? And and to have this impact we need to have in mind the big picture delivery paths so that indeed the technology is uh, used at the end of the day to really enable our partners in developing country to access and use this technology which is one of the final objectives. So the presentation uh, today will, will focus on having few words about the human expertise, talk about the infrastructure, how to access information and technology, mindset and change in behavior, absolutely critical and, and a big challenge. The importance of support services affecting partnership and the slides of, of conclusion. The human expertise, I mean, this is, this is again, a, a key element. There is no point to provide technologies if people on the ground do not have the expertise to, to use it. Uh, therefore, a large effort is allocated to capacity building of, of our partners. Several people contribute to this effort, and it can uh, be done through different channels. What is very, very important is that at least you have a strong components of capacity building embedded in the research projects. I think probably a decade or two decades ago, a lot of workshop was taking place on different technology, on different aspects. But you know, at the end of the day, those workshops are quite limited uh, because out of context of the research. So really, a focus of capacity building in, in projects, uh, having training, you know, people that are doing masters, uh, PhD students, and also these concepts of capacity building a la carte. It is really asking those people in the project, you know, what do you need to really achieve your objective? What do you need really to be able to do your job uh, in these collaborative efforts? And then to design the capacity building based on those very specific uh, needs. It's also very important to train them on the technology and related tools. And here again, we try to make it as efficient as possible. A different way those days is really through electronic uh, means like, um, 
you know, we can have curriculums and any learning that are uh, available. Uh, and we need also, of course, to use people on how to use the, the tool. So in the context of the platform, that can indeed transfer what they learn from a theoretical point of view and to put this in application. Who to train? Uh, of course, a scientist. But here I would like to make a point that it's very important that you train scientists that are expert already in the field, but also people who are young scientists. And sometimes it is an issue. We send an invitation to national program, and you know that very quite often they will send the more senior scientists, the person in charge of coordinating things, but those people are not really the doer. So when we made a call, you know, in the in, in our program to those kind of, of training, we always invited two people per institution, and we underline that we also want to have a young scientist because it's probably as important, if not more important, to train the, the new generation. Uh, the technician, we should not forget them and really ensure that also in the institution, if we are not doing this uh, ourselves, that you know we train uh, those people who are going to use uh, some of the very basic tool and essential to the, the station managers. Uh, during our, our interacting with our big networks, you know, we realized clearly that we train everybody, but we forgot about people who are preparing the land, who are managing uh, the field, and, and quite often those people are not at the level that is requested to manage properly the, the field. So we also developed a small program to train those people. They were extremely happy, and we saw uh, immediately a strong impact on the production of the phenotypic data. And of course, we need uh, to, to, to focus on the, the awareness of the program uh, and the conference. These kind of workshops are also extremely important. Last but not least, also you need to, to pass the ball and need to train people who will become the, the future trainer. An example of, of what has been doing in the context of the integrated breeding platform is to put in place a multi-year course. So this is a, a bit novel approach. Uh, we identified about 160 scientists from Africa and from Asia mainly. We invited them to come for three years. For three years and it's a couple of years every year. And, you know, we go with them through the different uh, topics that are listed in each of, of those bullets. Uh, during those two weeks, we divided them also in three groups. We have three major topics, and so we, we, we have them train on all these different um, uh, uh, fields in a, in a very efficient way. Uh, what is very important is that this continuity uh, over time, and uh, to ensure that it is uh, having an impact on what they are doing, we give them some assignment. And it's mandatory to be uh, accepted in the second year of the course that you can show that you are using uh, uh, the tools, that you have data in your database, that you are using the tablets or the tools that have been uh, provided. We ask them to show results on the statistical analysis um, using their own data. And we request also that uh, they share with us some plan in terms of molecular breeding. So, this is something that is important to make a follow-up with them over year and, again, to, uh, to have some security that they are indeed using and applying what, what, what they learn. Uh, this is a composition of the, the team that we are training. Uh, you have uh, the, where they are coming from with a majority. Here you have the abbreviation. Uh, you have a majority of people coming from sub-Saharan Africa, about two-thirds, uh, and, of course, as it is, unfortunately, I'm tempted to say we have, a, of course, a majority of male compared to the to the female, but we try to 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 improve a bit this this gender issue. Uh, it's very important also that you think about you know how you decentralize the capacity building. So it's you cannot afford to continue and and to have a, a centralized approach for for this uh, knowledge sharing. So we need to go at the regional level, and I will show you an example through this regional hub. Uh, very important also, taking advantage of those electronic means, you need to have online as much as possible very comprehensive uh, courses, support documentation that will help for the self-education um, of, of the people. Uh, and then we have several initiatives that, you know, and universities, especially in the U.S., who are working in developing material for prime reading. And, and we can find quite a lot of, of information already posted on, on, on different websites. Uh, you need to create ready-for-use modules with appropriate query tools that are uh, customizable depending on the, on the audience. I think it's very uh, important to also work on the ground with partners, with universities, as I said previously, train the future trainers, and also have decentralized support uh, services to take care of troubleshooting 
and build on social network for question answer uh, forum. Um, now talking about the infrastructure, I think this is absolutely fundamental and, and when you provide support to uh, um, a multi-partnership uh, initiative across different uh, countries and it is the case for the Generation Challenge program, you realize that you cannot give money uh, from to support all different aspects of the research, but we realize that this one is, is especially important. Uh, field infrastructure is a must-have and we are not talking here about fancy equipment, we are talking about very basic uh, um, uh, supports you know, for people to do a, a, a good job and not ending with having too much variability in your, in your field. Um, it's also critical that you don't provide only the money. We realize that in a lot of cases there is a proposal to buy some equipment, you give the money and at the end something goes wrong. They buy uh, there is a wrong voltage or you know there is a wrong diameter in your pipe etc so we have been paying a consultant and, and a small team to in fact go together with the users identify on the ground what other service provider what exactly type of material do they need and at the end they end up with the equipment that will facilitate really their their job access to phenomics facilities i put the question mark uh, i'm not sure it's very relevant at least at this stage uh, IT support is also very critical, but here instead of, of saying why we need it, which is quite obvious, I would like to understand to underline that perhaps it's a bit less relevant today compared to the past. I mean, there is now really increasing performance on personal computers, uh, cheap and transportable UPS, moving to the cloud a lot now that you don't need necessarily to invest anymore in big in big servers, and the cell phone technology is really a big boom and a lot now quite to help with the data management. And in general, all over the world, I mean, access to good internet connection is improving tremendously. And wherever you are, you basically can access good internet connection every every few days. Laboratories, it's not a limitation anymore, and I will I will come back on on that one. But let me just come back to the to the field support issue because I think this is fundamental to ensure proper and reliable phenotypic data. I mean, several of the national program of our partners are still struggling with uh, uh, with their uh, field experimental station, you know, how to clean, how to prepare it, uh, and we definitely need to, to help them. I listed here uh, different issues, land preparation, you know, uh, how you maintain also your, your equipment, uh, and again, there is a strong uh, a need to, to help them with this. We, we um, contracted a group of experts uh, five uh, years ago, and we sent them to the station of our different partners to really identify it first which are the stations that needs to be uh, removed from our network because they were really in, in bad shape and the one that you know had a good potential what was needed really at that time to bring them up to the to the baseline to have good phenotypic information um, and very important also when we decided to go and make some investment at those stations we had in writing the commitment of the station manager uh, that they will take care of the maintenance uh, of the equipment and, and the maintenance of, so of, the, of the station. This is just an example of what we invested uh, uh, in 2010, 2011. It's about at the level of 1.3 million. Uh, this has been done, conducted through the integrated breeding platform project, but also the GCP put about half of the money. And over the last five years, we put about, we invest about five to six millions on this equipment. As you can see, this is really very, very basic. We are talking about weather station, uh, which is critical to, to um, further on have an idea of, of the genotypic by environment interaction. We are talking about fencing, irrigation, uh, plot rehabilitation, uh, renal shelter, etc. So again, trying to bring those stations uh, to an acceptable level of uh, operability. But of course, this is still a drop in the ocean, and I will really encourage that uh, in your respective network, you try to identify uh, who needs what needs to be done and find the funds to do this. It's not obvious because in jail, not a lot of donors appreciate this and allocate funds to to this kind of um, uh, expenditure. But but again, it's it's absolutely critical because without good phenotypic data, I mean, this is just all all useless. That was just an example of some photos that have been taken on experimental station by at one of our partners. Really, those that were really far behind, as I said, uh, you know, were not uh, kept uh, in, in the loop. And, and again, a major issue is also the maintenance of the tractors and the other equipment. They don't have the technical expertise, 
uh, the service provider because they buy a certain trade that did not provide support in the country, so it's very difficult. You need to import things from outside, etc. So there is a lot of, of this, well, not only bad will of the people on the ground, there's just a lot of logistical issues that are difficult to manage, and, and that's why you need to consider those at, at the, the, the buying points to, again, to ensure that you minimize the issues and the problem that they will encounter later on uh, to maintain the equipment. Access to information and technology, I mean, this is really uh, something that is, that is fundamental, and I will start uh, with, with data management. I mean, uh, as you realize, more of the breeders in developing countries continue to capture their data by hand, and not necessarily only in developing countries, I mean, quite a lot of scientists wherever over the world, even the north in centers, etc., cetera, um, do, uh, do the same. Uh, and we need absolutely to raise the bar there and to move from this uh, handwriting to the electronic capture. And this is the first really objective that we try to do through the integrated breeding platform, is that have this shift that can have a huge impact on how we do a, a breeding business. Uh, it's a bit challenging because in general people are quite protective. Data sharing is a sensitive area. When we talk about the platform, you know, more than half of the case, the first question that people ask is not about the tool, is not about the technology, is, oh, what about my data? Do I have to make my data public? This is really almost systematically what people care more about. Uh, so there is a bit this, this protective attitude. Uh, and in general, we have to say that it's not a top priority because people know that they control this, there is no clear resource allocation for data management, and as a result, the data still uh, are in the hands of individual scientists, which is, of course, a disaster when people are leaving, uh, the, the data are lost, or it's, it's a big barrier, a big burden when you want to run through meta-analysis. Meta so data management has been one of the major challenges uh, in our collaborative effort, and I'm sure this is not only an issue uh, faced by the Generation Challenge program. How we can implement this? I mean, Gary already mentioned some of, of uh, the options during his talk. You know, really having a clear policy in place in the institutional level, really having the buying from upper management that's important. And you can improve the quality of the documentation and your data, you know, by uh, adopting electronic tool. I mean, this is one of the major rationale uh, to capture scenes electronically when you have a template, when it's mandatory that you need to fill uh, the different fields of your data capture to have a good uh, documentation when you have some query tool that allowed you to identify outliers and to make a first screening on how to, to clean uh, your, your data. Uh, it's important also to, to have API that ensure across the different system interoperability across the different database because, you know, generally people don't want to spend extra effort to make their data in another database, you know, so we need really to bring the system to their, to their own database, so it's very important. Uh, mandatory to have a proper budget allocation. In the GCP, we now requested over the last three years that there is a clear budget allocated to, to data management. It must be part of the evaluation process. I think CIMIT did this recently, and I think this was a very good move, you know, that, that data production and, and good documentation is, is a must, and it's a donor requirement beforehand, again, as the Gates Foundation is doing now. Things that is remain still important is not because you have all now this new way of capturing your data that you know scientists are, are free of responsibility. Again, the, the quality control starts really at the scientist level. It's extremely complicated and expensive to make uh, data cleaning retroactively. But if it starts from a very good you know uh, a le low level at the scientist level with the right uh, uh, template with the right tools, we, we probably will remove about 70 to 80 percent of the burden. This is just one of the key elements of, of a good data management system that allow interoperability in exchange, it's prop ontology. And as you know, we talk about this also over the last days. Uh, it's, it's a must because you need to compare Apple and Apple. You need to have the right, you need the, the same uh, measurements, etc. And this is why it's a must uh, to define uh, your trade dictionary uh, in, in your operational uh, system. Access to service laboratories, I mean, this has been claimed as a major bottleneck probably 10 or 15 years ago. Unfortunately, people in developing country, they can't uh, afford to build a lab, to access a lab, etc. Uh, now it's not an issue anymore. I think you have going to the web a lot, a lot of different service provider for genotyping, uh, marker uh, generation, sequencing. I mean, BGI is a, is a leader 
uh, now in, in this area. So no excuse. I mean, you will find the people who will be running your high throughput and routine genotypic analysis. And not only the uh, data point generation, but not only this, also the analytical part now, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the, of the service. And you have access to quite a number of those services on, on our portal. Uh, we personally, or at, at, at the level of the program, strongly discourage our partners to invest in those routine and large-scale uh, technology anymore. Uh, the technology is evolving just too fast. This is a burden on your staff. But rather have them focusing on uh, data analysis. Uh, and we need also to consider reducing as much as possible uh, interaction, you know, in terms of the process. So uh, even, if, for example, starting locally, the, the extraction of the DNA, I mean, just starting to send a uh, sample of leaf or, or of seeds. But this is still not only, only just a piece of cake. Uh, it requires more planning for, from the scientist's perspective. I need to anticipate when I'm going to have my sample. I need to contact the service provider, warn them, and agree on, on what will need to be done. And it's also not an, a security that uh, they will respect the turnover. We have been facing some of our service provider that are a bit slow, etc. So uh, there is still some, some issue that, that, that are, are real. Uh, this is just an example of, of what we developed uh, uh, to facilitate access to um, uh, marker uh, genotyping or for all those different crops that are uh, the amended crops of the Generation Challenge program. Taking advantage of a SNP sequence that has been uh, published, uh, we contacted those different groups, provided the information, we gave it to uh, K-Bioscience now, LC, uh, LGC Genomics, and they up using the CASPAR technology, those markers uh, that are available to whoever wants to access this uh, through the platform at quite an adventurous cost. This is a bit of a summary. You can see that our major user has been, without any doubt, the maize program, and in particular the maize program at CIMIT, uh, with about 25 million data points generated. And we had uh, also um, another set of 250 projects that generated about 3 million uh, data points. On the top of this, I mean, the service lab is also distributing to different uh, users. We have uh, uh, some technology in-house, some primer mix, which also impact on their, only facilitate their research. So quite a big, uh, big success on this regard. Accessing analytical tool and, and pipeline. Uh, first of all, we need really to distinguish between the research and the applied tool, uh, and of course, the standalone and the integrated tools. I think there is basically now on the web, publicly available, tools for whatever a scientist wants to do. I mean, there is really a, a diversity of tools that is extremely rich, uh, and, and this is not, not a limitation at all. What is the challenge is that, of course, when you go through an, an, an analysis and you need to do different uh, kind of analysis, then you need to jump from one tool to another. There is issue with format, input files, etc. how you collect this to your database, so there is also and absolutely need to have analytical pipeline uh, that you know facilitate your, your job. And here we have already quite a number of those pipelines that are available in both the private uh, uh, or are provided, sorry, uh, by by private company or are available through public effort. I listed uh, some of them here, and I know that most of them you you know about it. Of course, PRC had a presentation thing on the one by Andres on on, on the platform. Uh, I would like to underline perhaps the one on the virtual lab because I think this is quite unique. This is an effort that's going on in the Netherlands where basically uh, an association of potatoes, legumes, uh, small companies together with academics agreed to share some technology, to share raw data, sequence information in a very open way. Okay, they use the tools but of course what they keep pri proprietary is the, the biological value that they extract from the sequence information in their respective germplasm. So it's quite, it's quite a nice approach and it seems that it's going on quite, quite well and we are looking now to uh, have some of those tools accessible through the, the platform. On the public sector also there is quite a number of things um, going on. We heard this morning about you know, part of the Erie Strait pipeline. Uh, also Peter represents the seed of, of discovery. So uh, quite a number again of, of, of uh, initiatives and, and platform that, that are available. Uh, pipeline for us to put sequence analysis is in good progress. Allelic mining pipeline, there is, there is still some way to go. Rajiv, sorry, I'm not sure when I started. I don't want to get out of time, but can you tell me how much time I have till? So you don't know neither, right? 
<laughs> okay. Um, the other element of of, um, of of this access to some of the tools are important also for the adoption of the technology, what I will call the peripheral tools. I don't want to expand too much on this one, uh, but too often we forget about those. And they can really impact on, on, you know, on the efficiency of the pipeline. This is just the handheld computer, the tablet, you know, I know I talk about the tablet, you know, the RNS to make it easy to use in the field, the filters, etc., uh, the printer, barcode reader, etc. So we need to keep this in mind also because, as I said, they can affect the impact of the pipeline. They represent some cost and, in general, they are very local specific. So they are used by people on the ground, by technicians. So they need to be accessible in their language, in their system, and there is also some issue with the, with the maintenance. This is just an example of an effort going on in Nigeria, uh, where we have Yemi, the last slide here, that is training uh, some of uh, her colleagues uh, on, on cassava in the national program of, of Nigeria. Social network, I mean, this concept of communities of practice, I mean, this is also quite, quite critical and important to have a forum to exchange um, most of the breeders in those uh, national programs, especially this normal national program, they work a bit in isolation, uh, and you know that that's very good that they can access uh, a forum and space on the web where to exchange with with colleagues. Uh, I think that, especially at our age, I would say, uh, and and again we had a good example about the the smartphone before, uh, that that you know that. We, we do not still realize, I think, the potential of using social media to disseminate the message, to create the synergy among scientists, and to provide some good, good support to help people uh, doing, a, doing a better job. Mindset and change in behavior. Uh, I, I think this is a real challenge. I will say that it's probably the most important challenge in the public sector to have an impact. Uh, people, it's human nature. You are normally reluctant to change. Even if you see the benefits, I will give you an example. In my bank account in Mexico, you know, I know the bank that I have allowed me to have e-banking so that I can go in my computer and make my transfer. I know that this exists, okay, since probably last year, but I still didn't take the time to implement the system and I still go every two or three months to the bank to make my transfer and I hate myself because I say, why don't you take the time, okay, to, to do this? And, you know, it's just a question of the synchrony where you find the time. I go there, I left the bank, I say, I will do it, and I forget. And then, three months later, I must go to the bank because I have an urgency to do it. And it takes two weeks that they send you the code, blah, blah, blah. So it's a typical example. This is not a way of how efficient it is. It's just, you know, a question of the logistic and really take the time to do it. And I imagine, um, you know, the, the way to change this as I indicated here, it's a strong bottom-up demand. So when I would really be fed up or when I would spend the entire day in the bank, probably I would say, yes, now I must, I must do it. Or, of course, the other way is that it really be mandatory, top-down decision. Your boss tells you, okay, now you do it or, or you take the door, as it is really in the, in the private sector. Uh, but this also implies that you need to be ready to, to, to change. You need to change the, your, your habits. You need to dedicate time to learn new things. You need to take time to dedicate time to things that are not perhaps directly related to your work. Uh, this is very important. For example, helping with you know, trade dictionary or these kind of, of things. And you need to be ready also to share and exchange on your experience and, and data in a quite an open manner. It's really shifting from an individual to uh, a cooperative uh, uh, spirit. And of course, we know that the enforcement and implementation in the public sector is quite weak. And therefore, I think a big, big help is again through donors that can impose on some level of, of quality control on some rules of operation at the different institution. We have been facing some issues like this you know, in meetings where we offered to partners that we will pay to fingerprint their elite lines. We will provide a support uh, for them to insert this into a database. And then at the end we will go and visit them to see if they have any, any issue uh, in, in accessing this information. So I think we did as much as we could. Okay, during the meeting everybody was happy. When we sent a reminder or a follow-up message as for the germplasm, you know, we got 70 or 80 percent of people who responded. Uh, the reminder on one month after it was half of the people and I think at the end of the day out of 10 breeders we had two who sent, you know, and went through their germplasm and went through the entire exercise. So again, th there is something that is critical 
uh, uh, that we need to pay attention. And what we learn probably is that instead of doing this electronically, etc., we need to send people to their institution. We need to send people to sit with them, okay, and start really uh, going through this entire process of uh, of adoption. If anybody has also out of the box ID to help out to do this, we really will welcome this this feedback. Um, together of changing mindset is of course this issue and this notion of support services. Uh, to provide a technology without the support services just completely useless. Uh, how many tools are sitting on the website? We developed several of those and they are just sleeping there because all people don't know about it. So awareness is critical or people use it and at the first issue, bottleneck or because it takes too long or they press the wrong button, you know, say, okay, I'm, I'm in, I mean, I have nobody to call or who, are, who can help with me the, with this and I'm out. So technology development to a certain extent is the easiest part and we really need to pay a lot of attention and resources. I mean, this is not free. This costs a lot of money in terms of the time and the organization to have the right team, right team in place. Uh, probably some ideas for a good approach is to combine centralized uh, with local local team. Uh, we need a clear procedure who to call. When we presented the integrated bidding platform to people in the private sector, there is again the first question. Public sector is privacy of the data. In the private sector, the first question is who do I call if it doesn't work? I want you to have a clear procedure about your support services because we don't invest in a system that is not well supported, okay? So a clear procedure for, for this. And definitely we need to have a different services based on the profile of your users. Uh, some users, perhaps in national program, will need much more effort and capacity building, uh, on breathing support, while probably people who are most experienced in universities or, or private sector needs probably more help to customize the tool of the, of the, plat, uh, of the pipeline. The support service quality is really your presentation cards uh, to the entire system. And a poor support is, is just, just a killer. So just an example of why we plan to do this in the integrated breeding platform. We, pro we propose to have a professional support uh, services, so to uh, have some help um, in terms of the design of your breeding program, in terms of how you run your operation, uh, to have some support in capacity building. Uh, the three-year courses was an example. We want now to do this at a more local level and also in the interaction with peer. The breeding support is a bit challenging because it's not straightforward. It can be done at different level and definitely when we want to change also how people operate uh, at the strategic level, it needs some, some very qualified people to provide this support. So again, we need to think a bit more how to provide this. Another one is a technical support, you know, first level which is really at the installation when you download the pipeline, the tools and any issue that you can en encounter at this stage. And then, which is probably one of the key elements of this support, is on the day-to-day -day operation. You know, I'm using your system, something is not working, I don't understand something, who do I call, what do I do, please help me. And, and this kind of support can, can not be done centralized in a central way. You must have this uh, on the ground. And, and again, part of our initiative now that we are uh, going in, in, in phase two for the integrated breeding platform, and we start already this year, it's the implementation of these regional hubs. So you will have some centralized effort in terms of data management, uh, the, the pipeline, the breeding management system, the capacity building and the breeding activity. But on the ground, we are going to establish a dozen of regional hubs this year where you will have some breeding support and where you have this uh, technical support, one full-time person at each of those hubs who can answer and help the user uh, when they are going to, to face problems. So these regional hubs, we, we plan to support people in developing country, people in the, in the public sector, uh, with a focus first on Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia, and for uh, the commercial partners, the, the users who are coming uh, from the private sector, we will see and establish probably a commercial team, because as I said, the needs will be different. Uh, uh, they will need less capacity building, but probably much more um, technical support in terms, again, of the customization of what they have probably already, already in place. So, very, very important to the success of, of the adoption. Partnership, this is the last topic before I arrive to, to my slide of conclusion. Uh, it's, it's also a way so that you can overpass some of the limitation of, of adoption. Uh, true partnership, I mean, partnership is, is very sexy those days. 
whatever proposal, whatever initiative uh, has a lot of partners, you know, at the end. Now, it's half of the time, you know, it's a lot of bluff. And we play this game also too. I remember when I was a scientist, you were writing a proposal. The last minute you will call your two or three friends in a national program. They will run for you some phenotyping evaluation. You would give them 5 to 10K and, you know, job done. Well, this is not this kind of partnership that is first very productive and second that really help them uh, to, to go to the next level and give them some visibility. So we must talk about true partnership. How you identified true partnership? Very simple indicator, money allocation. Okay. The second one, what the partners bring on, on, the, on, on the ground, what they bring on the floor. And, and in quite a number of occasions, it's very important for them, especially like in country like like China or India to be part of an international uh, initiative. And when it works very well for those teams, as it happened now after 10 years in the GCP, is that thanks to what they did in the GCP together, they find money outside the GCP and they bring uh, you know, new projects around uh, the, the table. They of course need to have free exchange of information uh, and uh, it's, it's critical and, and absolutely essential that you have a good trust and a, and a good will among the different partners. Another way to evaluate the evolution in the partnership is that people who were leaders at the beginning become mentor, and then in fact people who are the doer uh, over time uh, become, become the leaders. Uh, this is uh, also something that is very important to have you know, uh, some sustainability in your capacity building and networking uh, because at the end of the day you want your experts to stay back again and, and support what uh, uh, your doer will be really uh, leading because they are the one on the ground, they are the one in developing country that needs to take, uh, to take the leadership. Of course, it will not happen at all places at the same time, the same team, speed at the intensity, but again, we need to keep this trend um, in mind. Um, last point, it takes a lot of time and, and, and resources to implement through partnerships, so this is something to, to keep in mind. Very quickly, uh, the power of grouping force, I will pass this slide. I will give you an, another example of, of efficient partnership uh, that happened in the GCP. This is when we work on, on sorghum. You know, this is an initiative that starts the first competitive call that we initiated in 2004. By that time, a scientist from Embrapa working at Cornell and uh, Leon Koshian uh, as USDA, uh, they put a project to, to clone one of the major gene for aluminum tolerance in sorghum. They screen a reference set collection. They identified very strong germplasm. Uh, very resistant uh, genotypes, they cloned the gene. Uh, at the second phase, uh, in a competitive project still, you know, uh, this was now led by scientists from Embrapa who screened their local germplasm for good allele at these genes that has been cloned for aluminum tolerance, and they identified uh, some quite good, good alleles. And to complement this effort, we allocate uh, as a third step a commission work that was initiated in 2009 led by um, the, the scientists from Embrapa, but in collaboration with different African partners, where they now transfer the allele that they identified in the Brazilian germplasm in African germplasm. And now we are very happy to have uh, in the pipeline breeding for those alleles, and probably the germplasm will be ready uh, in, in two or three years and will go for international testing. So we start almost 10 years ago with plantlets evaluate under hydroponics and the gene cloning work that now ends up uh, with, with improved germplasm in Africa with a stop of alleling discovery in, in Brazil. Uh, across country, I think this is another dimension that is quite, quite critical, the network and this notion of communities of practice. I don't want to go into detail here, but uh, this is an example where in Cassava we have been able to, to bring quite a, a, a remarkable group of partners uh, to work together, and thanks to this effort through the GCP, they have been able also to access and come as a group to a major and larger initiative that are now supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Important to keep in mind, uh, you have different way of doing partnership and you really need to think about what is the best partnership to achieve your objective. You can also need to be cautious. I mean, it's very uh, uh, easy to get distracted, it's very easy to say yes, and at the end, you know, we need to, it, it, it's, uh, it's time and resources that need to be allocated. Just a few words to compare what I will, my definition of public-public and private-public partnership. I think normally public-public partnership are very easy uh, to establish, 
that are very difficult to implement because most of the case we forgot about IP issues, we forgot about defining some rule of the games. Public-private partnership takes a lot of time to define at the very beginning, but you know, one, you have a clear roadmap, it's very easy to implement. And I think a public and private partnership is really a nice way now to, to move ahead and to boost a lot of uh, uh, research effort. Um, and as I said, again, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if it's managed well, it has quite a lot of, of very clear benefits. Um, my bit conclusion and perspective uh, slides about, you know, uh, what is needed and, and, you know, in term of the, uh, to really enable, again, our partners uh, to become in front of the scene and, and become leaders in using uh, this modern technology. Uh, that's, you know, accessing the tool and again the pipeline is not now a limitation anymore. Uh, I think the good news, thanks to a lot of effort that have been conducted in this area, the human capacity is progressing fast. I mean, through centers, through initiative, you know, we see now really a new uh, uh, cohort of, of folks that, that are very, very good breeders. Wacky, Aki University, this is another example, so uh, quite, pro, uh, quite uh, positive about this. The infrastructure for, for me, I mean, this is still a major bottleneck, and, and there is a huge of effort that needs to be done, and probably in a coordinated way. A lot of money has been allocated to support and boost the implementation of some key station in some project, but this doesn't make it. At the end, we, we really need to have a large network of station, of national programs, of CG centers, of private uh, private sector that you know offer a minimum uh, level of quality and offer reliable uh, phenotypic data. And I said for me, uh, uh, a part of PrEP's infrastructure, uh, this is a major challenge that we made. We, we, uh, we must have the support from upper management if we want to change people's mindsets. Uh, we need to be much more proactive. We need to go and visit people. It's not only an awareness that is done you know, on the web or et cetera, or through email. There is a, a ways of being proactive and out of the box to really convince people that they need to adopt it. It's not to convince them about the benefits. It's really to help them to adopt the new technology. And you need to start also at low level, just starting perhaps with populating database. The support is a must have. It needs to be reliable, quick, local, and adapted to different users. One size does not fit all. But the good news, I think, is that uh, the timing I I is right. Uh, there is now major public investment in this area. The technology is ready. As I said, it's not a challenge anymore, but it would be a challenge if the technology would be ready, but the technology is not an issue anymore. Uh, we have solid international networks, you know, through different initiatives, so the COP, the Gates Initiative, uh, what we are doing in international programs, such like the GCP, and there is also a strong movement to have now open access policy that should favor in exchange of, of data, of information across groups, it become mandatory in quite a, a number of institutions. And again, this should favor um, the, the promotion, the use of, of technology towards you know, a broader context because uh, I believe there is still a huge potential in running meta-analysis, which remains still a, a challenge of today. So with this, and, and this is of course, you know, we have all convinced that genomics have an impact on plant breeding, but still there are some points that need some clarification at a certain stage. Thank you very much. Thank you.